Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with chronic back pain or other mysterious pain that just won't leave you alone, then do we have the Back Pain Permanent Healing Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Steve Ozenich, author of The Great Pain Deception, Faulty Medical Advice is Making Us Worse, and Back Pain Permanent Healing. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about understanding the myths and confusions surrounding back pain and what in the world we can do about it beginning today. That plus we'll talk about Jim Carrey in 23, tails wagging dogs, what we can all learn from Tiger Woods, the 2% solution, pounding defenseless scarecrows, those poor scarecrows, what in the words vertebroplasty, six blind men and an elephant, and whether ostriches really do stick their heads in the ground. So welcome to the show. <laughs> gotcha. Welcome to the show, Steve. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. And you read my book. <laughs> Excellent. Let's help Woo-hoo! some other people shine. Absolutely. So before we dive right into things, I alluded to it a little bit briefly off air before we begin. began. I was hit by a car by, while racing bicycles in Europe, trying to make it to the Tour de France many years ago. The doctor told me, you hit the automobile or hurt the automobile. I said, au contraire. But I had hurt L4 and L5 in my back, and it took seven years, pain center after pain center, before I finally got better. What happened to you? My pain started when I was 14, Mm -hmm. and it lasted 30 years. And I tried everything, of course. I mean, sticking, stabbing, poking, medicating, therapy, even hanging upside down like a bat Mm -hmm. (laughs) at one point. And, of course, everything works for a little bit because the mind runs with that, that proposition. And it's basically shifting your conscious awareness away from the problem. But... It comes back because, as you know from reading the book, back pain does not come from the structure of the spine. It's more from the autonomic nervous system. And that's how to get to it, is to get to that part of it. Oh, it's something we talk about a lot on the show is how to get out of that fight or flight mechanism or how to get out of that sympathetic nervous system response. What, what started you down this road and how did you come to understand it? I didn't have any specific trigger. Mm -hmm. But it almost always begins with the self-imposed demands that we place on ourselves to be perfect people, to be good people, to never fail ever. And this is actually deeply enraging to the inner psyche. It's good for the world that we're good people and we're perfectionistic, often good workers. Mm -hmm. But the deeper aspects of the self, the more immature side, the shadow side of us, it hates this. And so we have what Dr. Sarno, who coined the phrase TMS, called the divided mind. It's divided between what you think you should be doing and what you don't want to be doing at the same time. And it's a very powerful force. It can cripple you with all kinds of pains and all kinds of health problems. And he called it TMS, by the way, for tension mind neural syndrome. I want to to jump in. I want to understand for for everybody who hasn't read the book, who Dr. Sarno is, what is TMS. But it's fascinating when you describe that as kind of this inner turmoil, this inner tug of war. And and certainly the slinky, might the, the, the spine, might just kind of collapse because it's getting pulled many, many directions at the same time. Uh, metaphorically speaking. I yes, suppose. yes, yes, yes. Metaphorically, because it's actually much stronger than we think. So who is Dr. Sarno? I'm glad you brought that up. He's the man that saved my life. I, In the 1990s, my back pain got so bad that I was crippled. I lost 54 pounds. Mm-hmm. I couldn't stand up anymore. I'd stopped eating and I, I was fading away. And a friend of mine said, hey, I read an article from this Dr. John Sarno that reminded me of you. And so I read the article and uh, I didn't believe it. (laughs) I didn't believe it. And now I teach his work around the world. But he was basically saying in the article that the structure of the spine is strong. Even these things like herniated discs and stenosis and scoliosis and osteophytes and arthritis is seen on the bones and the x-rays is not causing the pain there. The medical industry is associating those things with causing it, but it's actually an oxygen loss within the nerves of the spine that's causing the crippling pain. And when you understand that, virtually every single person heals. And I've been doing this almost 20 years now, and virtually every single person heals. But few people want to believe that. Few people want to believe it, and there's the problem. 
It's fascinating. If I go back to my injury, I hurted the automobile. I had a, a right angle in my lower left leg, so there was some, some actual, you know, bone snapping. But I didn't know what had happened with my back. And it wasn't until six months later that the back pain began to get really intense. And I was like, oh, they missed the back injury because they were looking at my snapped leg. But really what it could have been is I had just ended my professional run. My professional career was, was you know, cut down before its prime, so to speak. And so my, my psyche... I don't want to say it was going wild and it wasn't so much created by the mind and I'd love it if you can dive into that, but I can understand as I had PTSD and my mind was kind of crumbling inward that my back started, as we were saying, not really, but metaphorically crumbling inward as well. Great. That's pretty observant too. A lot of people wouldn't notice that. Now, yours is an injury is different than what we're talking about. An injury is an injury and it will heal. The body heals by nature's design, but the brain if you're in what I call a TMS state mm -hmm. of mind, you know, losing jobs, divorces, loved ones dying, whatever it is, the brain will be opportunistic and it will take advantage of that actual injury. And it will either latch onto that injury and it won't allow you to heal years and years and years later. People think that they're not healing, but the brain's just taking advantage of that. Or in your case, the symptom imperative shift that Dr. Sarno coined, it found something somewhere something was metaphorically going on there and it just began to spread it's trying to keep you riveted to your physical body so that you're not paying attention to the stuff that's happening back here the real stuff it's like staring at the shiny object stare at the shiny object so the brain will create these physical pains that are debilitating as he said tms is the most uh crippling thing he'd ever seen in, in clinical medicine but it's harmless it's harmless. And so the brain will run with whatever it has to keep you diverted away from what you don't want to face. So before we dive into even more of this, I feel like a little clarification would be, would be awesome here, which is it's not for people who are suffering with back pain or chronic pain right now, it's not so much that the pain is all in the head. It's that, for instance, the brain takes blood flow away from the nerves or away from the spine, and it absolutely physically hurts like hell. Because of the trick the brain is doing with kind of moving around a shell game to face and keep us from dealing with something else. That's the shell game, exactly what I talked about in The Great Pain Deception, too. And as Dr. Sarno said, it's the most crippling thing you'd ever seen in clin clinical medicine. And yes, this is not imagined. A lot of people are offended by it because they say, I'm not faking my pain. This is debilitating. I mean, I've, I've had people pass out right in front of me from it. When the brain withdraws the oxygen or the blood, it's the blood that's being withdrawn and there's oxygen in the blood. You can't function. Everybody understands a cramp, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's in your calf or where. Imagine a cramp from hell that won't go away for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. That's what's happening. And the brain keeps looping it. It's using it to help you. It's actually trying to do you a favor, as Dr. Sarno said, because of all these emotional things and all these thoughts that are unwanted. They're either too sad, <clears throat> too powerful, or too threatening. And it comes along and says, okay, I'm going to help you cope now through your day. I'm going to give you a physical thing to obsess on. That way, this stuff can remain as hidden. And so it, it, I can only say this. It works virtually every single time. What, what's cool, cool if that's the right term, when you say something is hidden is, is um, I did a bike ride years ago. Uh, across the country, got to meet with Congress. It was this cool little thing to try to help people. And I got kind of pulled in. I'm, I'm fairly apolitical, but I got kind of wrangled into um, promoting the Mental Parity Act, which is to say that issues going on in the mind should have as much uh, right to be treated as physical ailments. In this society, we don't see them equally. And so it makes sense if you, if you can't, if somebody's not giving you help because of something going on in your mind, you would create a physical thing to try to get that help that you so desperately need. Well, that's a big topic. And I would say from this work, the Dr. Sarno, he actually turned the world upside down on its head, created a new paradigm of thinking that Almost everything that we get mm -hmm. is from the mental process. Almost. Not everything. There's congenital things. There's pathological things, you know. But uh, things like chronic fatigue and um, uh, Lyme is one of the new ones. And, uh, well, it doesn't matter what it is. Almost every one of these things is coming from a mental, emotional process. But the big money is in treating the body. 
the trillions of dollars are entreating the body. And so, and plus, remember, it's it's like a protective mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's helping you. It's protecting you from things that you do not want to know about. And so people do not want to hear that that's the case. They want to believe that something's wrong with their physical body. And so when they go to the doctor and he says, you've got a tear in your rotator cuff or a meniscus tear in your knee, the, the pain is almost never coming from those things. The brain is using those changes. The brain is using the herniated disc, is using the arthritis to keep you firmly convinced that something's wrong. And since it's trying to help you, people say, okay, I don't have, I have a bad back. I can't do anything about it. It's out of my control. It, mm -hmm. it, it lets them escape the responsibility for their lives. It, it's fascinating. I wrote with my wife, we wrote the bestseller, uh, Barefoot Running, many years ago. We were, we were kind of partially responsible what was going on with everybody out of their shoes there for a while. And I did that after I had acquired from a uh, near-death accident, number one. We won't go into it today, but I've had have two of these. I acquired a titanium rod in my left leg, a titanium hip, had 10 knee operations, a hole where my ACL used to be, and it wasn't supposed to work at all. And yet, by slipping my feet out of my shoes, I was able to heal. It, it, there's a lot more, obviously, going on to it and run like, run like the wind, more or less. And so we would hold these clinics, and people would come up, and they say, I have bad feet, I have bad back, I have bad knees. Can you help me? And I would say, well, if you look at me, the odds are pretty good. And then they would immediately boomerang back, a lot of them, and say, I'm unique, I'm special, I am my condition. This is something you talk about that, that, that Dr. Sarno talks about, the two percenters. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, the two percent solution. I've been doing this almost twenty years now, and everybody thinks they're in that two percent. And what that means is, is he did a follow up survey once mm -hmm. to see to follow his patients. You know, there's they're healing with no drugs, no surgery, no injections, no physical therapy, and so they randomly went through the files and pulled out a hundred people and checked up on them, and ninety eight percent were healed, two were unchanged. So. All the thousands of people that I've worked with, they all think they're in that 2%, that they're unique. You just said it right there. Everybody thinks, you know, this TMS thing's right, they tell me. It's absolutely right. The mind affects the body, but not me, not me. My back pain's different. I saw a disc there. I saw a tear in my rotator cuff. I'm unique and I'm different. And they are not. They are not. I mean, my back is so bad, so bad. After 30 years, it looks like I couldn't even walk, but I'm fine now. I golf, run, lift. No pain at all because it's an autonomic nervous system thing. A thought emotional process is not coming from the structure of the spine itself. And of course, the placebo trials that you mentioned there, they prove this true. Yeah, and uh, for myself, after that first uh, that first near death experience, I had an inch leg length discrepancy. At least so I'm told. It's all, it, it, you know, the way the spine works. Who knows? But I did have one leg that appeared longer than the other with all the titanium parts in it. And yet the back was fine. Right. You're, you're the bionic man. Yeah. I mean, I, they give me shoe lifts all the time. You know, yeah. it's, it's a quarter of an inch off. Well, it's so, after you know, understand Dr. Sarno's work, it's so insane at some point because everybody has a leg different than the other, a hip higher. They call it oblique, obliquity in the hips. It's not coming from there. They're just, they're, it's a spurious correlation is what it is which means a false correlation. Mm -hmm. They see, I've got a hip pain, and then they look, oh, that's one's higher. That must be where it's coming from. It is not coming from there. I saw a guy in the store last year. He was, it was obviously some type of uh, congenital thing. His leg was like five or six inches shorter than the other leg. He was, wow. you know, and I asked, I stopped him. I said, do you have any back pain or hip pain? He said, no, why? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just needed to. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I said, this is what I do for a living, but, uh, it, it's not coming from there. But this is the thing. The mind is so powerful. Some people will immediately heal when they put the shoe lift in. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go, my doctor's a genius. My back feels good. But they don't understand the brain believed that it worked. That's how powerful the brain is. It can heal us or it can kill us. Absolutely. Let's go. I want to talk. I'll, I'll dive a lot more into this. But beforehand, we were talking about how to pronounce your name. And I apologize if I still didn't get it right. But but you said I did better than Howie Stern. And and I understand Dr. Uh, Dr. Stern, Howie Stern <laughs> had his own back challenges. And, and I'm wondering if you can share about that. Yeah, he's one of our uh, great mouthpieces for this movement, this TMS movement, because 
he was very crippled like I was. He said, you know, I was at my wit's end. He was doing his show on his back with a microphone taped above his head. And uh, he, he tried everything and it just didn't work. Alexander techniques, you name it, trying to strengthen, pull, whatever. He said uh, he heard about Dr. Sarno. So he, since he's fairly close there in New York, he went to see him. And just like a session or two with him, it was gone. And so, of course, he's been singing his praises all these years. Now, he was 20 years pain-free. Mm -hmm. And then some, some things started happening in his life in 2016, and the pain came back once again to help him, to help him cope. And it, at that exact same time it came back, I sent him my books. I, I had no idea that he was having I back pain. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, serendipity. And so he got them, and he loved them. And he started talking about it them. And uh, so I'm supposed to go on that show pretty soon. I talked to his producer because he's one of the great people. But Senator Tom Harkin, mm -hmm. the guy who created Seinfeld, uh, Larry David, they yeah. all went to see him. And they're healed like after one or two meetings. As soon as you realize my brain has been distracting me, it's been fooling me into thinking something's wrong, a lot of the time it disappears. What are some of the early steps that he does? And if only two sessions he's able to, I imagine a large amount of time is like this, is the education of understanding what is TMS. And I want to dive more into that. But what are, I, I hear that he gives people homework, for instance. What, what kind of homework is he giving people? Sometimes, well, he's retired now. Right, right. He, he, yeah, he's 93 years old. He's still in there, hanging there. He's a hero to millions of us, actually. But um, if you went to see him, I guess typically if you went to see him, he would quickly look at the MRIs or mm -hmm. the, the radiology report, and he would throw it aside. And a lot of people would say, aren't you going to look at that longer? And he would say, do you want me to? And they would say yes. So he would go look at it and stare at it for a little while longer for their benefit. Because he could tell hey, they're only looking to see if there's a danger there, like a pathological process, a malignant mm -hmm. process. Or I've run across a guy who had uh, an aneurysm in his spine, which isn't what we're talking about either. But he would quickly look at them, throw it aside, and then talk for like an hour and a half to the person. This is how you get to the person. And it's always, you know, red flags you're looking for. Someone's died. Uh, you know, I, I'm in school getting my master's degree. I'm getting a divorce. You name it. And it looks for relationships with the parents early on. It looks for personality traits, of perfectionism, and goodism. This notion of being a good person is deeply enraging when you're trying to keep everybody happy in your life. It's very enraging. And so he comes to the conclusion. We would call it a diagnosis of exclusion. In other mm -hmm. words, look at the most dangerous thing first. Rule that out so that the body's not in danger. And then talk to them and back into it and then say, you've got this, this syndrome called tension myoneural syndrome. But you were asking about a program. You know, he always said, I don't have a program for dealing with chronic pain. I have a program for dealing with the cause of it. So we don't treat symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go get an injection, you're treating a symptom. If you're operating, you're treating a symptom. If you're medicating it, you're treating the symptom. We go right to the cause of it, which is unconscious anger and fear and anxiety and all of those things that you will never feel because they're unconscious. And it took me a long time to grasp that, too, because I kept saying, well, I'm not angry. I, I don't feel this. It's like, uh, duh, you dummy. It's unconscious. It's unconscious. You will never feel it. There's only that one person that you probably read about, Helen in mm -hmm. my book that he saw and he, he practiced for 50 years five decades he was a doctor and he that was the only person he ever saw where the unconscious burst through to the conscious and the pain disappeared in seconds but so it doesn't work that way you just can't reach in and try to feel these they are buried for good and you they're buried so when we talk about buried and we talk about being able to see based on what's going on in somebody's life, what's going on, one great example, I'm not sure if great is, is the word, but because, because I feel for him tremendously, but, but, but you could see on TV even Tiger Woods and what was going on with him. Yes. And you saw in my book, I laid out the events in his life where every physical symptom came on. And most people can do that once they begin to read about TMS, they begin to say, oh, yeah, that happened when my parents got divorced. That happened when I was in school. So he, of course, you know, he, he I think everybody knows the story, right? <laughs> he was a public figure. His pains began at every point in his family where they were breaking up. Mm -hmm. And it began shifting through that symptom imperative that Dr. Sarno observed. In other words, if you uh, have a back pain, let's say, and the doctor thinks it's from the herniated disc, which the, the studies prove that it doesn't come from the herniated disc. 
and they operate, which is an artificial means, he would call that. Any artificial means you use to take away the symptom, your brain will not be denied. It will simply shift it somewhere else. And we see it a lot in knee surgery, you know, our shoulder surgery, they'll operate. It, it doesn't need operated on, but they'll operate, and then it'll go to the other side, mm -hmm. and then the doctor will say, well, you're putting more pressure on the other side. That's not true. The brain just simply shifts its strategy and begins withdrawing oxygen there at that point. And you can chase this around forever, like picking up mercury. The brain will not be denied. And he, he coined the phrase symptom imperative phenomenon. As long as you have psychological conflict that demands attention, your brain is going to give it. And we see it a lot when people have a back surgery that they think worked, but it didn't. And then they get an ulcer soon after because the brain just shifted its strategy. It's that powerful. This is, this is stuff you don't mess around with. It's powerful. So what I do like, and this, this jumps way ahead in the book, when, when you're going through a list of, I believe it's myths and, and things that we don't think can be healed, that the majority of the time, if you've had back surgery, you can still heal because people go through one back surgery to the next to the next. And, and, and you and I both know of so many people who the first back surgery, you know, that's only the start. Once they're going in, they're in for a, a whole line of them. But they, st they still, if they get if they can wrap their minds around this, can still heal. And it's really a healing from the inside out. Get Step away from the knife at that point. Yeah, yeah. The, the knife is just really trying to bypass the problem, hopefully a quick fix. But it, it won't work. It doesn't work. We've never, I've never really seen one work. Although some people think it had, mm -hmm. but they don't realize that the new problem that they just came up with after their surgery is actually still the same problem. They don't realize they think the first one actually worked because the mind believed it. Like Houdini said, what the eye sees, the mind believes. And so, my, of course, my favorite one is that fake pain pill. But we could get into that too. But yeah, this process is, oh, oh, is go truly ahead. Tell, tell me, tell me, fake yeah. pain pill. Yeah, that's the one. I, it was up last month. It was all over the national news. And I'm on all these Google watch lists for this stuff that I do, of course. And the scientists came up with this fake pain pill. And they said to the people in back pain, you see this pill right here? It's worthless. It won't do a damn thing for you. They took it and about almost 40% of them got better. <laughs> and which is, which is the center of my first book, The Great Pain Deception, that it is the relationship. This is what the scientists concluded. How could this work? You know, we told them. You know, usually they thought the placebo is fooling the body, right? Mm -hmm. It's fooling the mind into it. But it's deeper than that. It is the relationship that you, they had with the scientists. It's the human connection. It's the human connection. Like I talked about that in my first book, the, the rabbits study done at Ohio State University. Two, group, two cages of rabbits. They're giving them fatty foods to study hyperlipidemia, mm -hmm. and high cholesterol. One rabbit's cholesterol is skyrocketing. The other one's plummeting. Same diet. And uh, the, the scientists are like, what is going on here? And then they discovered that they, these technicians were petting that one we're cage, cage of rabbits. We're messing with the rabbits. <laughs> yeah. And I've had so many people tell me my pain immediately stops when someone touches me. And why I think that ch they think chiropractic works is because you're, it's human connection that heals all so many of these physical problems, human connection. And so the fake pain pill, they came to the conclusion that, hey, it had to have been that the people were expressing their concerns to them and connecting with them. And that's, that's how, what I do when I do consultations. It's, it's this deeper understanding of what the mind is doing to the body, which you're not aware of. And then, of course, building the confidence of the person to believe that they have the syndrome because most people don't believe it. I didn't believe it. I thought it was crazy. I thought Dr. Sarno was crazy. I did. I, I threw his book. And now I teach his work around the world. And I will say again, they're all healing. They're all healing. What allowed you to jump the chasm from this book? Apologize, I've got your book in my hand. This book is <laughs> trash. I'm throwing it across the room to going, it's worth a try. <laughs> yeah, well, well, fear. Fear, right? <laughs> fear is one of the greatest motivators, right? I, I wouldn't say we should use fear, but it sure does motivate people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a couple, I was probably a week or two away from surgery. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to have surgery because my wife was paralyzed permanently from the waist down by a doctor who put an injection in her spine, permanently paralyzed her, made her paraplegic. So I was f scared to death of surgery. And so I got worse until I could no longer eat. And so I kind of, you know, suffering opened my mind's eye a little bit. 
So I went back to his book one more time. I said, all right, I might as well give this a try because I don't want to do surgery. So it suffering, suffering pushed me into the truth. I, I, I want to say I like that, but how do you say I like that about suffering? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, I guess if we're not going to open our our mind to truth, we will suffer. We will so, always suffer. Let's go from that, and I want to talk. I want to talk uh, some more about some of the, if we call them solutions, some of the the modalities that we can use. But before we do that, you talk about we have to stop defining our body's flaws as causing us pain. Can you talk with some of these things like like quote unquote degenerative discs, slipping discs, a, a pinched nerve, a bulging disc, all of these things that were shown on MRI, here is definitively the absolute cause of what's going on. Exactly. It's like, you know, seeing the ground is wet every time that it rains. And so they come to the conclusion, oh, wet ground causes rain. You see, spurious correlation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, yeah, that, that's a big topic that you just opened up, you know, but there's over three dozen studies done showing that herniated discs and stenosis does not cause pain. And there's not one single study in all the medical literature that shows that they do. And yet people will still believe the images because they associate what they see with their eyes mm -hmm. on the images with the sensation of the symptom. But the proof that it is not, those things are not causing this, is that the people heal, even though the things are there. So there's no way that it's possible that those things are causing it. But once again, we also have to talk about the authoritative archetypal influence of the physician. How powerful that is in our lives, that white coat. People tend to believe them deeper when it comes to the health problems, because mm -hmm. we, we want to, we need someone to fall back on when we're scared and we're afraid of our lives. And so that figure, when it's it's accidentally doing harm, like Dr. Sarno said, it's gross malpractice practiced regularly, wow. operating on discs. They don't need it. I've never, I haven't seen one yet. Now there might be somebody out there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always anomalies in life. You, well, you talk about a, a study. I think it was from 1994 that found that uh, back surgery was effective back then, and people can say we've come a long ways in surgery, but at least as of 1994, that one out of 100 people had a successful long-term outcome from back surgery. Yes, yes, that was a survey that they did by the government. That, that organization has since changed its name to something like Quality of Healthcare or something. But yes, they, they followed low back surgery patients, and one out of 100 said it was successful. And I would question that one too, because that person may not have known about the symptom imperative and that their new knee pain was actually the, the old yeah. back pain. And so, but Brzezinski is the guy's name who did these studies. He, he did a meta analysis on all these back studies and they came to the conclusion, these things aren't causing the pain. And then there was another one by this Kaitanen guy in, uh, it was in the Netherlands, I think, or the Finland. And it was studying stenosis, the narrowing. Mm-hmm. And of course, I see, see mine. It looks like there's no room for the nerve to come out. It looks like everything's pinching the nerve. There's no room, but I don't have any pain. And their study concluded that people with severe stenosis were able to move around better than people with moderate to mild stenosis. And so they concluded, ah, the disc herniating and the degeneration, it's, it's narrowing, is actually helping, preventing pain. It's preventing pain. And of course, I always talk about Andrew Weil. You know, Andrew Weil, the doctor, America's yeah. doctor. They call, yeah, I call him Santa Claus doctor. He, he, uh, he, he was the keynote speaker on this uh, great lecture in, I think it was Chicago, and it was all on pain. And he said, they showed us, the, all these other pain experts came in to talk. They showed us MRIs of people that looked like they could not even walk. It was so bad, and yet they had zero pain, pain-free. And then they showed us, MRIs of perfect spines and the people were debilitated. They could not get out of bed. And he said, to my mind, that proves Dr. Sarno correct. It has nothing to do with the imaging. It has everything to do with what's going on in your life at the time that the symptoms start. And, and I like that the imaging can actually show a healing 
process. That, okay, you healed from this, you show an imperfection, quote unquote, imperfection here. That was your bond. Well, I, I know, like going back to that auto accident or getting hit by the car in France, I have this huge bump over my lower leg. That doesn't mean that I have a problem. That means that it's actually healed there. And it's yeah, probably it's actually healing. the strongest bone of my yeah. lower legs. Yeah, that's a good point. There's, there's several good points there. The first one is, is that Remind me to never ride with you. <laughs> okay, that's the first point. Second point is, you know, if you pinch a nerve, mm -hmm. it will die quickly. I've pinched nerves and I've paralyzed my hand and my leg. My left leg was paralyzed for nine months. Wow. And the, the whole time I drug it around for nine months, no more reflexes, no more sensation, couldn't raise it, nothing. And then, of course, the neurosurgeon kept saying, you're pinching a nerve there. We better get in there and get that disc off there. But it wasn't. It was no blood getting to the nerve. And so that's why it was paralyzed. But um, if you pinch a nerve, you will be paralyzed quickly. And the nerve will die and it will never send pain signals anymore. So we know when a nerve is really pinched because there won't be any pain there. <laughs> okay, there won't be any pain there. But yes, and your point is well, well made. You know, uh, the body by nature's design knows how to heal itself. And so when you're cut or whatever it is, it will heal. If you're going on and on month after month, year after year, you need to look into this TMS process. So I want to go back. Thank you. I want to go back a couple steps ago. Then I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the how-to or some, some healing or helpful modalities here, which are really in the mind. But you were talking about the, the white coat syndrome. And, and it's something I, I wrote a book for students and adults with learning disabilities many years ago. That's kind of what precipitated that bike ride in Congress, all that good stuff. And I talked about the cycle of pain, which is you go into the doctor with this great hope. Doctor, cure me, heal me. They give you this pill. Oh, thank God. You take that pill. It works for a little while. It stops working. Your hopes are completely crushed. You go back in there, bearing your soul, and around and around you go. And this seems, when I'm thinking about the spine, and I'm thinking about a, a, a spiritual cause to everything, the spine is about keeping you strong, keeping you on your own two feet, about keeping you tall and being able to support yourself. If you're going in and giving it all to a white coat, and, and there are a lot of beautiful doctors listening, I'm not trying to imply anything of that sort, but Important. when you disempower yourself in that way, it does make sense that you, in a sense, get weaker in your back because you're no longer supporting yourself. You're giving the power to support yourself away to someone else. Right, right. And a couple of good points again you brought up. You know, first is, is we're not, this is not an anti-doctor message here. It is not. It's an it's a misdiagnosis is what it is. Yeah. They're misdiagnosing it. Well, I mean, modern medicine has done some amazingly fantastic things. And you're you're living proof right there. You're sitting up right. You know, it sounds like you had quite a bit of it. <laughs> Transplants, uh, you name it. Uh, hip replacements, knee replacements. Most of, most of them don't need done, but the ones yeah. that do need done. Are, yeah, the, the, we, we had lots of broken parts. I run like the wind now. I run like the wind. I'm at on a hip sled where you push your legs up and down. Uh, I'm at 900 pounds. I'm working on my goal for this year is to get to 1,000 pounds because I just don't know that it can't be done. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't ever be too smart to know it can't be done because we are, it is about consciousness and energy and things like that. And when we're, we're consciously obsessed on our physical bodies and that's what the health industry in general wants. That's their business. We're not patients, we're clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they're always saying first hint of this, you better run there, you better run there. And so people to avoid their, all the the relationship problems is where it's coming from. The relationship problems and the one most important one being with yourself. Mm -hmm. Then we, we look to our bodies as a safe haven to run to. And so when it's collapsing, we think it's collapsing. The brain's just trying to help you, man. It's trying to help you cope through your days. And so it's all out of control. But this is not an anti-doctor message. That's a good point right there. We're not pointing fingers, or like I said in my new book, or pointing with any particular finger. <laughs> you know, Because doctors also saved my life, like Dr. Sarno did. He saved my life. So there are great, compare, compassionate people out there. So that's important to know. We're not out there slamming slam it. We're, we're, telling, we're trying to inform the public that it, they're misdiagnosing things as physical problems when most of them are not. So let's go from there. Let's talk. And, and we might double back around depending on how much time we have. But I want to give some people some tools to work with. And one that you talk about several times in the book is conscious breathing. 
Yes. 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 I, I first started calling that proper breathing, but when I started talking to the breathing experts, they're going, not proper, consciously, <laughs> consciously. <laughs> and so the brain associates chest breathing with anxiety, fight, Up flight. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Most type T, we're talking about a type T personality here in this type T for tension, mm -hmm. perfectionist, goodest, warriors, hyper responsible, hyper active. And so, um, the brain also associates belly breathing with a relaxation in the parasympathetic nervous system. And the problem is in a hectic life where we're driven by goals and money and material things, we're always in fight flight. Mm -hmm. We can't get out of it. Our new tigers and lions that we run from are our competitors. You know, that's that your boss is the new tiger now and you're trying to keep them happy. And we're in fight flight all the time. The amygdala is interrupting the harmony of the autonomic nervous system and you've got digestion problems skin mm -hmm. problems blood flow problems asthma a lot of people with tms a lot of tms is asthma the people get overwhelmed and they can't breathe and so this this thing is deep it's very deep and this doctor is the greatest doctor in american history he deserved to win the nobel prize for it and all he did put a movie out with him by the way it's, it's a film called all the rage it came out last month in Greenwich Village. I like that it has the word rage in it because when yeah. you're talking about the spine, a lot of it is stuffed anger. Yeah, it, it's rage. It's abs It's approaching rage, but you'll never feel it because they put on this. I like to call this the lie that we put on every day. This smile, you know, this face is super ego mm -hmm. for the persona, which means mask. We put this on for the rest of the world to accept this, so we don't get rejected and alone and isolated again. And so all this stuff's happening behind the scenes. But yeah, he changed that title at the end, and I told him that was pretty cool because it's got the word rage in it because it is unconscious anger and things like that. And then Ray, all the rage, it's in vogue. And he was the first one that said, I went back and I looked at the medical literature, and back pain wasn't in that in vogue in the 19th century, 20th century. But then, then foot pain came in. And then if you remember carpal tunnel, it heated up well, in the 1990s yeah. and it went up by like 500% in six months. Well, you, you talk, when you talk about things being in vogue, and it's interesting when things come into mass consciousness, you talk about, I believe it's, it's Norway and Lithuania and whiplash. And I was fascinated by that one. Yeah, that one's been around for a long time, but it's always a great one to go back to. You know, they, the, the doctors in Norway were trying to figure out why the people in Lithuania don't have cases of whiplash. The countries are almost the same size population, almost the same amount of rear end collisions every year. And so they put a team together. They went down there. Harold Schrader was his name. And they started talking to the Romanian drivers and they were going, you were hit last year in the neck. Yeah. Is it still hurt? And they would say, how could it still hurt if it, it happened six months ago? They, they couldn't understand the notion of it, mm -hmm. of whiplash. They had almost no cases whatsoever. But up in Norway, they had this elaborate system set up to handle victims. Okay. So now what the government's doing is really saying, all right, all your personal problems, we're going to take them away. We're going to tell you it's really coming from a physical thing. And so it was out of control. But that's not the only study. There are many more like that. There's a particular word that you just hit right there. Which is, which is important and goes back to, again, the crumbling of support, metaphorically, as I keep coming back to, of the spine, the importance or danger of the word victim. And once you label yourself a victim, just like labeling yourself, I am my back problem, I am my knee problem, I am my this, once you've labeled yourself a victim, how hard it is to get yourself back up out of that hole. Well, yes. And I talked to the TMS physicians that Dr. Sarno had trained and they say, you know, those ones are really lost when they identify with it is, you know, I, I'm Steve, I've got a bad back. That's how I'd introduce myself sometimes. You're more than that. But did you, you read about the study, the other whiplash study, which is more interesting. The one where the two, they had two Volvo cars and they put people in them and they simulated a crash. Mm -hmm. It was like virtual, you know, like Steven Spielberg, a virtual thing. They simulated the ground flipping upside down. The cars never moved. The necks ne never moved. And yet 20% of the people had neck pain after, immediately after the study. A few months later, 10% of them still had chronic neck pain, even though their necks never moved. But this is the important part. They, those people were the ones that scored highest on the psychosocial stress scale. 
they had the things happening in their lives. They had the type T personality. They had all those things. And so their, their mind just ran with what it was seeing. So let's, let's talk about real briefly, then I want to go into a little bit more of, of some of these other helpful modalities here. You type T personality, goodists. What is, this is something that Dr. Sarno discovered early when he found his, his uh, solutions. He was doing what everybody else was doing for the back and it wasn't working. And he dug deeper and found people who have problems, have back problems, it's funny I put it that way, have these, <laughs> these the tricks <laughs> as well, have these problems as well. Right. Yes, you know, it's such a niche thing, you know, that a doctor would actually talk to his patient, which is pretty rare because now they'll, they walk right in, they look at the charts, scribble a script and walk out. Mm -hmm. But he was old school. He graduated in 1950 from medical school. Okay, He was still old school. He talked to them. He said, I began noticing. Well, first he looked at their charts. He said, the people with back pain have, you know, frequent urination, allergies, asthma, they have all these other things going on too. So he began to talk to them. He noted this goodest perfectionistic tendencies to try to make everybody happy all the mm -hmm. time, worrying about this and this, and mildly anxious to severely anxious. OCD is part of this thing too. But yeah, as he got deeper into it, he realized this is not a physical problem. And so he, he started telling the patients, what I think what's going on here is your brain is trying to distract you from all these things you have in your life. And they, some of them healed right there in front of him in the office. And I've had that happen to me too. People with fibromyalgia, I will do a consult with them and it will be gone. After two hours, it's gone. And wow. back pain, I've had a couple after two hours, the back pain's gone. Now, those are the rare ones. It doesn't normally happen that way. Usually you have to get into your life more and start reflecting more and trying to have more fun in your life, trying to let a little more go. And, and there's no really one cu cookie cutter method. That's the problem. There's no program, I would say. It's, it's all up here. It's all up here. So, and that's, that's a lot of what our show is about, is the getting up here, is taking the journey on the inside, because the healing really always does come from the inside. But you mentioned one fun right there, which is having fun, being happier, or uh, laughing more. Oh, yes. I, I was basically healed by the time his third book came out called The Mind-Body Prescription. But he introduced a phrase in there that really changed my life forever. He called it the rage to soothe ratio, Ooh. like a fraction. Mm -hmm. And he said, we see something in our practice. These people may have a normal amount of frustration, anger, fear for the life that they're living, You know, whether it's a high-stress job or a relationship, whatever. But they are not having enough counterbalancing, soothing, pleasure, fun. right? And so it's just work, work. Work, work. You know, I, and they never feel good. They always feel insufficient as people. And so they're always trying to raise the bar higher and higher, working towards happiness. Mm -hmm. cool. but as you know, the, the Buddha said, you know, he tried everything. He tried he tried starving himself to death at one point in a cave. There's there's images of him emaciated. And he, he came to him under the Bodhi tree. Oh, it's not something you strive to get towards. It's here right now. Right now. If, if you choose it, it's about perception. The perceptions have to change that your life's going bad or that you're not good enough or that something's wrong with your body. That's the first perception that has to change. Even though there's a pain there, it's not coming from there. And so this is about the inner work. You're nailing it right here. This is it. All healing comes from the inside. Now you may, and if you're very sick, you may need a little help from medical science. You may, you know, especially if you're bleeding, you know, we've got to get the bleeding stopped. But almost everything comes from the inside. Almost everything. It's really, it's really powerful, powerful stuff. One of the ones that you talk about, thank you, this, this falls right in those lines when we're talking about the inside, is one of the things that we don't want to do is start talking about, dwelling on, or associating with the pain. For instance, if, if, as I'm reading this on back pain, my back is starting to get <laughs> sore because what you focus on is where things pop up and start to appear. So if you're continuously saying, oh, my, my back today is a, is a six or a seven, or I'm noticing this or that in the back today, in the back today, you're, you're kind of perpetuating this cycle, this, uh, the monkey's on the bike in your head and it's just going for a ride. Yes, that's, that's part of the OCD uh, nature of the personality type where uh, instead of cleaning your kitchen floor a hundred times a day, like some people do, they're looking at their, bo their body. How's it doing? How's it doing? How's it doing? That's OCD. But um, I had a guy recently, he said, you know, I didn't believe anything you were saying. He said, my knee was so bad. It was so bad. And I tried and I read the books and it wasn't getting any better. I thought TMS is crazy. And he said, 
And then I broke my foot and the knee pain disappeared. <laughs> it, he said it hasn't come back. See, his awareness, consciousness is really the word here. Mm -hmm. The awareness shifted to the foot. As, as it does when you're doing surgery, a lot of people believe that the surgery worked on their shoulder or knee or whatever it is. But really, they were so frightened of the surgery. Their obsession now became the surgery. And the symptom begins to wane. But then months later, it comes back. You know, and then the doctor will say, well, it's kind of you're putting so much pressure on this and this. No, it's just it's back. Your brain needed the, the little shining object again to stare at one more time. So consciousness is really the word we're talking about. Since since we're going down the consciousness rabbit hole, I I, I love this. Oh, Alice in Wonderland. Oh, this is a here. deep hole. It's a deep, deep hole. <laughs> Meditation, spirituality, connecting at our core or at our essence. Dive down that rabbit hole any which direction you want. Well, we could start at the top of the rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Where the rabbit enters the hole. Um the this thinking. These people are thinkers by personality. They're ruminators. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are procrastinators. They live in their minds instead of their hearts. And when we think, that's mental calculating. When we're thinking, we're running through scenarios, right? What if, what if, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? That increases beta wave activity in the brain, the highest frequency. And beta waves associated with anxiety and all the highest hospital visits and everything. So what we really want in our lives is alpha state of awareness, this relaxed calm where you're aware of what's going on, but mm -hmm. you're very calm. But unfortunately, when you're in fight flight all the time, we're in beta. And so yoga is the ultimate goal, really, is to calm the waves of the mind. And then all of the joy begins to rise. All the happiness begins to come through. The light of consciousness, all the answers begin to come through in a meditative state. They call it alpha state or whatever you want to call it. I, th I think Kriya Yoga is probably the, the highest way that you can go is to just calm the waves. Just keep looking for that inner light. So yeah, you can keep going. The rabbit holes, it's endless. Oh, I was, I was going to say, and to realize you're not, you're not the wave, you're the ocean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. The, the ocean of consciousness. Yeah. The ocean of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is where it really comes down to. But TMS is what gets you there when you begin to realize, oh, it's my awareness, my obsession, my need for a diversion. The not not knowing that these problems are even there because they're unconscious, trying to escape the responsibility for a life that didn't go as I had planned it. All of these deep heartaches, you know. So to avoid the heartache. We move into our heads. We become intellects and we think instead of living in our, in our heart. It's fascinating because when you talk about uh, looking at the studies, looking at the literature, diving in, and, and, and people have really dove down the intellectual rabbit hole for healing, as I have. I've been one of these people. It's, it's really a... In science, one of the challenges with science is, is the deconstruction of the tearing things down, of breaking things apart, which in a sense, it, it may sound weird, but it is actually a violent action of breaking things down rather than the holistic, the co cohesion of the all. And when you start going to the head so much to heal, you're kind of ripping things apart trying to find a way to heal when the answer may be to actually put the mind aside, that the little mind that is, not the big mind, and go to the heart instead. I have nothing to say. <laughs> that was that was well said. I mean, that was perfect. That, and, that, and that's what I do mainly in consultations. If I can get them past obsessing on the body, mm -hmm. that that's exactly right. You know, science is not determining truth; it's unveiling it. This truth already is. I don't need a sci I don't need a scientific study to tell me that birds can fly. Okay, they do. <laughs> they do. And so, science is basically trailing it, trailing truth. It's trying to dis dissect it. And I, don't, I don't know if it was Mark Twain or not who said you can dissect the frog, but you kill it in the process. Mm. When you're trying to study it. Or they're killing us. And there was, a, if I get it right, doc, Dr. Wheel, who you were talking about earlier, Andrew Wheel, was saying that um, what he, how did it go? Something to the effect of um, science ends up proving what I see working on my patients. I do what works. I don't need the science to back it. It's not that we're anti science, it's just going on the intuition. Right. I read that in one of his books. He's a, he started the Arizona Integrative Medicine Institute, where you actually get into the life of the person. You know, and that's where that's where it's going to go in the future. Mm -hmm. It's not working. The other methods are failing. 
But uh, that's right. That's exactly right. He said, you know, I I have to go what's what's working in my patients. I can't wait for a study to tell me that it's okay. You know, if this is saving this person's life, and he knows damn well, you know, Wiles a smart man. Mm -hmm. He said, it's their belief. It's their belief in it that it's working. And that's what a placebo means, to please. I shall please. If if this, if holding up this thing here pleases you and you think it heals your elbow, it's going to heal your elbow. So, so let's talk about a few more, then we'll start to wrap things up. A few more things that may help people. First off, looking at your relationships. Yeah, well, that's the heart of it. My first book's called The Great Pain Deception, and the first line in that book is, life is relationship. I mean, what else is there, right? Mm-hmm. What else is there between yourself, your loved ones, God? It's all the same thing. This dual object split, you know, that doesn't exist. It's all one thing. We are one consciousness. And so right there is where it really, really needs to end, is to dissolve into this. There's a great saying in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, knowledge dissolves into pure love. All knowledge. That is such a cool thing to look forward to. Right? Woohoo! Yeah, yeah, right. We've got so we got that going for us, like Bill Murray and Caddyshack. <laughs> exactly. The, the Dalai Lama <laughs> yeah. said, "When you die, <laughs> yeah, full consciousness." So I got that going for me. <laughs> but yes, uh, all knowledge will dissolve, and when I moved out of my head mm -hmm. and into my heart, I healed. But it took Doctor Sarner to show me who I was, and he, he basically was said, "You are already healed." You're already healed. You stop trying to heal your body. And of course, this goes right into Greg Braden's work. I don't not I don't know if you're familiar yep. with it, but they healed that tumor in real time when you when you understand it's already healed and you, you believe it in your heart, then the consciousness begins to shift. And it begins to give you what you want, whatever you throw back out into this matrix. Like if you say, I'm going to heal one day, I'm going to heal one day, then you keep getting that back. You're going to heal one day. You never get there. Like basically, like the Buddha said, right? And so when you say, I am healed. Oh, and that and that was a light bulb moment for me when I realized Dr. Sarno's telling me, I'm already healed. I'm trying to heal my back for 30 years. It's already healed. It went away immediately. And it's never come back. It's been 17 years now. Been pain-free. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> exactly. I, I like one of the themes there. And we'll use this as a, a last theme before we do some wrap-up questions. Everybody go out, get the book, Back Pain, Permanent Healing, and your first book, which is, again... The Great Pain Deception, Faulty Medical Advice is Making Us Worse. It's two international second places, the International Book Awards. It took 10 years to write. And it's, oh, I started, I wanted to show people what was happening here, how cool mm -hmm. this really is, right? So I started a thing at YouTube called TMS Healing Wall of Victory. It's on the back cover of that book. They can go look at these people that were absolutely crippled devastated they had tried everything some of them had been to 25 doctors they're all fine now they're all fine now but they but they were open their mind to tms so on that note uh urls where can people go to find out more to find your book and to the youtube channel yes the youtube tms healing wall of victory mm -hmm. and of course my website steveozanich.com or steveozanich.com either way <laughs> works and i do consultations because sometimes people need a boost of confidence and then we talk about some of the things that we talked about here, but we get it usually into the family. It's it's trying to understand their mindset. I will use the words that they t say to me. That's the indicator of what's happening. And then I'll, I'll imitate them back. Look what you're saying here. Look what you're saying here. And I make them see themselves. What's an begin. example of that? Well, one of them was like that. I'm going to heal. I'm going to heal. <laughs> you know, I know I'm going to heal one day, Steve. I'm going to do it. I'll say, stop right there. Look what you just said to me. You know, you're going to heal one day. You're already, as you sit there, there's nothing wrong with you physically at all. And so they start thinking, okay. So you begin thinking deeper and deeper and deeper. And then it does something to the deeper survival brain. And it begins to shut down its fight flight. Mm -hmm. And it, it starts moving back into harmony one more time. The heart, people have lost their murmurs with this information, the heart murmur. I have one. I had one I had when I was seven years old with rheumatic fever. And I know that it was TMS now. I know that I gave it to myself because I was anxious at that time. It's, it's, it's interesting. And one of, the, one of the last thoughts we have here is, and, and now you're relating it in my head to the amygdala and getting out of the, the sympathetic into the parasympathetic. Stop trying to heal. Yeah, yes. And that's hard to do because we as people, we always think we have to do something to heal. I've got to do something. 
you know, I've got my shoulder. I can't raise my arm. It, it went into my shoulder once. I couldn't raise my arm or push any doors open for months. And uh, immediately, I want to go do something to heal it. I want to inject it or operate it on it or I got to do some therapy with it. Doesn't work that way. The first thing, well, you always have to, oh, it should be responsible with your life. Mm -hmm. Make sure there's no malignant process happening. Be very responsible. We're not telling people not to go to doctors here. It's dangerous. But once you've been cleared for danger, start thinking, okay, what is going on in my life right now? You know, and it's usually the thing you're not aware of because it's been blocked by the ego. The ego's been blocking. I didn't realize at one point that my marriage was over because it's unthinkable to me. You know, because when I was married, you know, it's for life. You know, I, I took mm -hmm. a vow. And so you cannot allow yourself to think that way. But then all of a sudden, Dr. Sarno comes along and, oh, my God, it's I've been blocking that, that it's ended in my heart. And so I'm, I'm in a way, I'm punishing myself. In a way, I'm diverting myself because the, me the pain is both a message and a distraction at the same time. It's also telling you you're not happy. That makes sense. From there, and thank you for sharing on that. My wife, Jessica, she's the producer of the show. She always likes me to ask a question about parents and their kids. And I'm trying to think what we can teach our kids to help them from going down this TMS road or getting into a cycle of pain themselves. Well, we could write a book on that su subject too, because, it, because TMS begins in childhood. It does not begin as an adult. <laughs> it's a personality thing and not a physical body thing. It, it, our health is basically incumbent upon our personalities by and large. And this begins, like Carl Jung said, you know, around five or six years old, we begin to form this personality of trying to make the people around us happy. Because the little kids, we have our antenna up all the time. All they want to know is what do those people want from me? Because their biggest fear is being abandoned, being left, not being alone in their life. And so, you know, it's a tough subject. It's a tough subject because most of these people with TMS, they were abandoned. Mm -hmm. A lot of adopted children contact me. They have a lot of chronic pain in adopted children because it's an emotional abandonment. Dr. Sarno said in this great 2004 Medscape interview that he did, he said, a lot of my patients sit in front of me and tell me they didn't have enough emotional support as a child. And so what happens is we've, we got to become better in our minds so no one ever abandons us. I'll become perfect. I'll become nice. I'll become good. I'll push harder, harder, harder. But all you're doing is destroying your health. You're not really getting happy. You're trying to make these people happy. And so it begins in childhood. But there's also, you know, the yin yang, the balance of it. A lot of children are spoiled. And, the, you know, and so they become codependent. And when you're codependent, then they rely on everyone else to decide if they're happy themselves. They have to have other people tell them. And so there's really no secret formula. As we know, life is life. You know, it's got the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's going to be ups and downs. And karma is going to kick you in the butt. There's nothing you can do. It's how we react to things. You know, our, our past is gone. It's gone. It's just a memory. There's nothing we can do about it. And the future doesn't exist. There's only one thing right now, the moment. Right now. Right now is the only thing that matters. You and I are consciously connecting here, hopefully through this heart waves too at the same time. Absolutely. And this is the only thing that matters. I know 20 years ago, I would have been thinking about all these things I have to do. My brain would be calculating. I wouldn't be in the moment, the mindfulness in the moment. Call it the gift yeah. of the present. The gift, yeah, that's that's right. That's right. You know, and uh, I know I know there's some Buddhists that don't like that term mindfulness because it sounds like the mind is full. And you're really trying to empty it. It should be emptiness <laughs> or something like that. But it, there's many things that people can do if they really want to heal here. And everyone mm -hmm. has TMS, by the way, to some degree. And, it's and not I, I want to pause you for a brief sec because I, and, and I know we got it. We really get to wrap things up. But but I realize that through the show, people might be being driven batty because I'm not sure we gave the title or titles for what TMS is, which is tension myoneural syndrome or the mind body syndrome. Is that correct? Do I have that second yeah, one right? It's it's evolved because he first called it tension myositis syndrome. When he thought it was just muscle involved in the 70s. But he's, he said, oh, this is connecting, this is withdrawing blood from the nerves and tendons too. So he changed the name TMS to tension myoneural syndrome. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of his career, he realized it's affecting the immune system when we, we were emotionally upset too. And so he changed it to the mind body syndrome. So it's evolved. And one thing we know for sure, he changed the world. And I urge everyone to try to watch that film, the, All the Rage, because it's 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 a powerful thing very powerful awesome awesome so just two quick wrap-up questions we've got for you which is first off it's a question we love to ask all of our guests what gives you the greatest happiness or what i call the woohoo 
factor. That's easy. Helping other people. I, I don't believe that we can be really happy unless we are at some point. Because when you get to the highest levels of consciousness, and of course I'm not there, but when as you get higher, I should say, <laughs> a good high of consciousness, you begin to realize... You, you do look are, like you're high on consciousness. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He opened my mind a little bit and an entire universe opened up for me. I can now see that person is me. I am that person. And so I'm helping myself when I help them. And if you have resentment or hate somebody, you chain yourself to that person for the rest of your life. You're their prisoner. When you forgive them and you forgive yourself, you free yourself. So forgiveness is a part of this too. So I think it's it's definitely helping people. I mean, I've had people heal from, well, a guy had stage four cancer contacted me. He's on that wall of victory if you want to, if you want to see it. Actually, a quote from him. And uh, to, to see these people that were in pain for 10 and 20 years, and he tried everything. A guy contacted me from Finland who had 44 years of back pain. And he said, your book took my back pain away. And so um, all of these things gives me the greatest joy I've ever had. The greatest joy. So that was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? I would say... That uh, open your mind up. If you have a chronic condition mm -hmm. and you've been there over and over and over and you can't find an answer, this is your answer. Now, if you do have a chronic condition you think they found the answer for, think about why it's chronic, why it's not healing. It's like Dr. Weil said, if it's not healing, something's blocking it. Because we heal by nature's design. We do when we're in balance, when we're, we feel right, when we have joy in our heart, when we're forgiving other people, we, we will heal. And so what can it hurt? It costs about 10 or $20 to buy a book. What can it hurt? And, and, and I see just as you alluded to, you did, you didn't even allude, you said straight out a few minutes ago. And when we talk about different modalities that are all the, I don't want to use the word rage, that are challenges that are aff affecting or afflicting us today, one is autoimmune conditions. And, and, and I know it very personally, my wife, not my wife, um, geez, my, my wife had a condition for a year and a half, two, three, excuse me, three years from mold toxicity that she was able to get through. My sister is struggling with lupus at the moment. And I believe that a lot of what you're turkey, talking about can help at least some people with autoimmune conditions as well. Yeah, Dr. Sarno didn't get into it a whole lot, but there are some of the mind-body doctors that believe that things like lupus are. And of course, Gabor Mate is one of those. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's, he was a Canadian doctor. He has a great book called When the Body Says No. He, he, he said he could see the autoimmune things in his patients. He doesn't practice anymore. He travels around the world lecturing. He's a really high, high paid lecturer. But he says, there's no doubt about it. You know, the autoimmune things, MS and that, they're co coming from the deeper needs of the person that are very deep, very painful, emotionally painful. And he asked some great questions in that book about his, to his patients. And the, one of the ones that struck my mind was he said, a lot of them said that their goal was to change the world. And that's quite a cross the bear really is. And I always said that when I was married and my ex-wife would go, you always say that you want to change the world. And I think it's just so you don't get rejected, you know, so you'll be accepted. <laughs> and maybe you didn't feel you were accepted as a child, but that's a, that's too much of a cross the bear. People were okay. I would say these people were okay. You're good. You're okay. Forgive yourself that you haven't lived up to these standards. It's impossible standards, but that is a great book title. When the body says no. It's like Dr. Sarno's The Divided Mind. That's another great book title, too. And so, um, yes, these people can heal. Anybody that's listening here, you know, your, even your friends and relatives. I've never done a show on a radio show ever where the producer didn't have back pain. Every single one of them has back pain. And Dr. Sarno said those people have a lot of back pain because of mm -hmm. deadlines. They have to meet deadlines all the time. And there's a great story. I don't know if you got to the, to the testimonials at the end of my book. The one that went to see Dr. Sarno, she was a producer. She crawled wow. in on her hands and knees into his office and she walked out. And he looked over the desk. He goes, why don't you sit down? I can't. He goes, okay, stay there. And she <laughs> he was on all fours talking to him, you know, and she said, I, I'm, produce, I'm a producer. And he went, oh, God, I see so many of you people in here. <laughs> you know? Of course, he's in New York, too. He was in New York. But, yeah, the pressures that we put on ourselves to, to perform and to be good people, that self-imposed demands are the cause of most of our health problems. 
I cannot, Steve. I, I like you. I wanted to say it during the show. I like you. You are awesome. You are uh, fun. You are cool. <laughs> well, well, thank you. You know, this is fun. And I, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to spread this message. By the way, this message is spreading fast. I'm working with CEOs of corporations. I'm working with professional football players. I worked with an Academy Award winning uh, uh, actor. Um, these people now are telling their friends and it's spreading faster because of the internet. If we relied on TV and radio, you know, those walls that prevented the messages from getting out, this message would never get out because this is a grassroots message. It's going from person. Every time someone heals, they're telling somebody down the line. So it's people like you that are helping the truth. It's the, the truth is riding on your back. Let's put it that way. Oh, no pressure. I want to keep that support and that back strong. Oh, wait, yeah, right. it is strong. That's Woo! right. We are strong. Yeah, it's the strongest part of the, the human body. And that you talked about autoimmune. That one lady on the TMS Healing Wall of Victory, Anna's her name, A-N-A, mm -hmm. she had the markers for all of that. She had been, I think she had 25 neurologists and doctors. They were telling her things about vasculitis and lupus and all this stuff. And it was just, it was TMS. The markers begin to elevate when you're in this emotional state, a TMS state. And I believe that when it gets to a certain point, it's too much that the body begins to attack itself. That so, makes sense. So yeah, it does make sense. But this is a, this is at a deep level of, in the brain. It's very very tough to get to. But if you've got it, it's something, and, and I we we've got a caller good here. But it's something that Jessica and I look at uh, all the time, which is if somebody comes to us with a physical condition, even if the physical condition is like a repetitive injury. You have to look at, well, what's causing it? I kept breaking a toe years ago and breaking it and breaking it and breaking it. And it was clearly my mind's way of getting my attention. Yeah. Well, now you're talking once again at the highest levels of consciousness. And I studied for 10 years in that first book. And the most fascinating person I ran across was named George Grodick. Mm -hmm. He was a medical doctor in Germany. He died in 1934, but he was a student of Freud's. And Freud began to idolize the guy who was such a genius. But at one point, Grodick said, I'm not doing anything to these people. It's what they believe that makes the difference. He said he had one patient, two patients with the same diagnosis. One would die, one would live. One believed that they would live, one believed that they would die. So he stopped becoming a medical doctor, and he went into massage, mm -hmm. see, autonomic nervous system, right, Sym parasympathetic, and psychoanalysis. And he said, and it was a great book once, he said, a patient came to him, fell down the steps, broke his leg. And he said to the patient, why did you feel the need to break your leg to come see me? And the patient was horrified. What do you mean? He goes, that's it. This, this is what's happening at the conscious level. You know, I needed maybe to connect with somebody or I didn't, my life was an upheaval, right? Or my life's as, an, as a wreck, right? My life is a wreck mm -hmm. right now. Those are the kind of things we need to look at because this, the universe will manifest these problems. Oh gosh, we've got to call this good. But I had a first near death experience, tight, left me with a titanium femur and titanium hip on the left leg, quote unquote, inch leg length discrepancy. The second quote unquote accident left me with a matching identical titanium femur and titanium hip in the opposing leg, no more leg length discrepancy. And we can say I slipped, or you can say at the level of consciousness, I asked for it. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, not consciously. But no, not consciously, but I absolutely was trying to learn something. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to listen the kind and gentle way. And so I got it with the two by four. But See, that, that's, that's, that's well said. Once again, that's what happened with Dr. Sarno's work. I, I wasn't listening. So I had to get so bad. It's like the truth is knocking back here. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello, McFly, right? But we're not listening. We're not listening. You know, it, I think Lynn, Lynn Grabhorn, she was the one that wrote all those books about this. People drawing. She said, I knew friends, they were constantly falling down. You know, they're breaking things. You know, we called them, you know, clumsy. But, you know, she says, I began to talk to these people. They had like clumsy personalities, <laughs> you know, at some point. But that's, you know, and we'll probably never understand it. It's so complicated. It's so, you know, maybe we come awake at some point. So, but, uh, this has been a fascinating talk. I'm sure we can go on and on and on. I really treasure this. Everyone go out, get back pain, permanent healing. And geez, Louise, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show, Steve. 
can't thank you enough for thank everyone you. out there. This is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get back pain permanent healing, and let the healing begin and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that you know, that was fun. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity because this message gets blocked at every turn. You know, if you go, I mean, if I do articles, I write articles from magazines and that, it, sometimes they'll just block it. They won't put it in because they're advertisers, they're chiropractors, drug companies, and they don't want to risk losing their advertisers. So very good. Very good. It was fun. Thank you. Awesome. Glad you enjoyed it. I'll keep in touch. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>